Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, guys. My name is Angelo. I am an alcoholic. Angelo. Yes, can you hear me okay? Okay. Wow. So, um, yeah, I've been sober for two and a half years now. Um, my home group is the Rehabilitation Center. Sure. Um, my home group is the Rehabilitation Center that I graduated from uh, two years ago, this October in uh, 2014. It's uh, the ARC, Seattle's uh, Salvation Army. Um, I have a deep affection for them, and um, I love that place. So that's my home group, and I have a sponsor. His name is Ed. Um, he's my new sponsor, and so I'm about ready to do another round of steps um, to start off with. So how did I get here? Um, I like to drink, <laughs> essentially. But there, you know, there was more to that. Uh, I come to find out many years later. I'm uh, now 44 years old, and uh, this is my second go at uh, trying Alcoholics Anonymous uh, wholeheartedly. I had a little success in 2006, and uh, I managed to get four and a half years under my belt. And then um, I just really wasn't convinced anymore, even though my bottom is very low. Things got so good that I um, I decided to give it a try. And slowly but surely, and then it seemed like uh, the carpet was pulled right from under my feet, and I found myself um, homeless again uh, in soup kitchens. So, um, just like, uh, how did I get here kind of a feeling, you know? Um, so with the way it started was I was about uh, 14. I was living in Torrance, California. And my mom worked two jobs. She was a chemist. And so uh, she raised uh, me and my brother by herself. And I guess she was a go-getter. So she had two jobs, one working as a chemist and one working for an aluminum plant um, across the street from each other about two miles away from where we lived. And we had a lot of freedom, you know. We grew up with, uh, you know, um, don't open the door for strangers, don't answer the phone, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, make sure you look out of the window before you, you know, answer the door. Um, we ate well, we cooked for ourselves, and with all that freedom and not a, not a whole lot of... Um, Accountability, I guess. Me and my little brother decided that our place was going to be the party place. It just was. It just seemed so natural, because all of our, all of our friends that were just other kids, um, um, it just seemed like we found found each other on purpose. You know, um, I can't explain it any other way. We'd uh, we drank. You know, we'd uh, save our little lunch money and. Um, we'd all meet up at the local little convenience store, and we'd ask adults to buy us beer, and they did. And then we'd take it back to my place, and we got to drinking, and it just felt, after a while, it just felt normal. The 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, and so on, it just felt like that's how you lived as a young American kid. You know, it wasn't until years later, I remember now thinking about it, that there was one kid in particular... It just dawned on me um, not so long ago that his parents wouldn't let him hang out with me anymore. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why because we were such good, you know, schoolmates, right? But it dawned on me that she saw that, I don't want to say, you know, that I was alcoholic, but that I was a bad influence maybe. You know, I was a good kid in, at heart, but I drank and I always, you know, smelled of reefer, Right? And uh, and so that went on until I was about 21, 22. Everything seemed to be okay. Um, it was a, it was just a big party, high school. Um, but I was definitely my own stumbling block. I might have had some kind of smarts about me, 
but with all of the um, extracurricular drinking, I couldn't manage to um, graduate in high school, you know, when I was supposed to. Um, but I could sure, you know, dance with the best of them or stay up all night or drink with the best of them. And it just, uh, like, that seemed like that's what I was good at. And um, it stuck with me. Alcoholism, it felt like it stuck with me. So my mother passes away um, about 22 years ago now. And when that happened, <laughs> that's when emotional drinking started. It stopped being fun and it became all inclusively emotional, but I couldn't turn it off. And then I started to realize that I was falling in this deep kind of a depression, but I couldn't stop drinking. And I really wasn't uh, attuned to putting two and two together. If I could have just stopped, I might have been able to have been more um, available in my own life and handle this emotional episode more maturely. But and that never happened. I just fell into the swing of, um, into this downward spiral. So... When that happened, I went to treatment for the first time. I was in my early 20s. And after that, I just needed to get away from Los Angeles. And uh, um, I came to Seattle for the first time. It was in 95. And uh, I didn't stop partying after treatment. I, you know, I picked up right where I left off. But this time, um, Seattle was awesome back then. You know, It really was. It's a lot different now. <laughs> I kind of miss the old Seattle, but I, I love it here. This is home. Um, so I'm living in Capitol Hill, and uh, I meet a good buddy of mine who we're still good friends today. We were like thick as thieves, if you will, and we were just drinking buddies to the max. And um, I was now, so a couple of years had gone by, and I was now 24, and uh, his mother sent him to treatment, and I was um, left destitute to be homeless for the first time. And um, I didn't know anything about shelters or um, I knew about programs, but I had um, I had um, some money that my mom had left me then and I used that the first time. And after that, I just wasn't sure how to get back on track. So I was fortunate enough to get a job at a Jack in a Box at the UW on University Avenue there. And um, the manager let me sleep upstairs and then I slept at Gasworks Park. Um, on the sundial, and I thought I was at some some nights. I felt really adventurous, like this really cool Tom Sawyer kind of <laughs> kid. You know, I woke up one night, oh, excuse me, one morning with uh, rose petals all over me and a bottle of Crown Royal and five bucks, and and uh, I thought that was really cool. You know, um. But really, I was, you know, February was coming around, and it was starting to get really cold. And because I had the little job at Jack in the Box, I was working in graveyard cooking there. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't get back on my feet, you know. Oh, I went from waiting tables at Chang's when Chang's was on Broadway um, to living in a nice little room for two hundred bucks on Denny, which now is some cool condo, but anyway, to living at Gasworks Park. Um, so I decided to buy a one-way ticket to Hawaii, and so that's what I did. I found uh, a cheap flight for 100 bucks, went away on cheap tickets, showed up there with $700, but I, um, I was still alcoholic. You know, I couldn't get it together. I, I was sleeping on the beach for 10 and a half months, pretty much, you know, from island to island. Um, I was passing out flyers for $6 an hour, staying in a hostel for like $15 a day. Um, eventually they kicked me out because there was bed bugs and I dragged the mattress down to show the management and he was irate with me and he kicked me out. Um, and I just couldn't get it together. So, you know, I've been pretty fortunate then the last few years. Um, I had tried to get sober on my own up until 2006, and um, there was a little bit of um, get up and go and, and get your life together in me. But 
every time I reached a certain point in my life and I started drinking with my working buddies again, I found myself not being able to control my drinking. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't get it, you know. I didn't understand why my work buddies, we could go to the bar and they could drink and show up to work and everything was fine for them and they could hold a job and pay their bills. And I just couldn't wait to drink and party. I just couldn't wait to get off work, you know. And I st- I had dreams, like uh, career-type dreams, but I, um, I just couldn't make it, couldn't make the mark. So in 2006, I gave it a try. I went to treatment at this Matt Talbot Center, and um, I was scared. I was scared then, um, scared enough to, to give it a try, and it worked for a while. But then, um, like I mentioned earlier in the beginning, when I was um, four and a half years sober, I just graduated college. I worked full time, went to school full time. Um, um, I'm still in debt and all that good stuff. But I saw that I could do it, right? And I thought maybe now I could drink. I had my dream job. <laughs> you know, I had uh, a nice girlfriend and I lived by the lake. And um, it seemed like I had it together, you know? And um, she drank, and she had it together. She was a really talented um, film school artist, uh, student. And, um, and so we drank every day. But it was, it's so funny. You know, she could still drink. You know, we're still friends. And uh, she's now in Italy drinking, you know, hanging out with um, people that make movies and stuff in Italy or whatever with her, with her new boyfriend and stuff. And... I'm still alcoholic. I still can't drink. Um, that's really the uh, the beautiful thing about the program is that when I read that in the doctor's opinion and how it explains the allergy and the phenomenon of craving and um, how my body works when I drink, um, that was helpful, you know. But my own history of living my life and putting the pieces together and seeing that it was going nowhere, those coupled together really um, has made sobriety um, more than interesting to me. I've become more than interested um, in, my, in my life. You know, I would mentioned before in another meeting that I've, I've seen a couple of you here that my last time out, um, I was getting to the point where I was talking to myself and um, not only was I noticing it, but others were noticing it, you know. And I never had that happen to me before. And it was, uh, that was scary. But, you know, that wasn't enough for me to stop. What was enough for me to stop was, I don't know. One day I was, this was in San Diego, I had, um, I left Chicago. I had some family in San Diego that called me to be with them to come home, and and there was a chain of events that uh, that happened and left me destitute again and drinking heavily. And um, there I was, and I um, I didn't mention that I was a pastry chef, right? And I worked for a, a really reputable hotel in Chicago, and uh, I loved my job, and. Um, I do. I, I I love I love baking. But uh, um, when I when left to, to San Diego, I uh, I just couldn't I just couldn't put it down. You know, I started I started in Chicago to pick it up, and when I got to San Diego, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't put it down. And then I found myself uh, living in my truck. I worked for this Belgian baker, and then I was a supervisor at another uh, bakery baking beautiful bread, and I couldn't put it down. And I was working myself to the bone, and I I felt like I needed to drink to survive uh, the long work weeks, and um, I was just losing my mind. Um, I was working some crazy, crazy hours in the middle of the night and then the afternoon, and it was just too much. Um... And I couldn't, I, I just couldn't do it. So I gave up. 
I left my keys on the table at one place, and I never showed up to the other, and they still owe me a check. And that was some years ago. And one day, after about seven more months of being on the street, I woke up. Um, I found myself uh, in handcuffs for temporarily for just a few minutes, enough to get a citation and to show up to court and have the judge uh, um, say, you know what, you're going to... You're going to go to some meetings, and I want you to prove it to me. And that so brought me back to the rooms that way. And um, I listened, but I wasn't ready. And I listened, and I wasn't ready. And more and more I could see that the environment around me, as I left the meetings, I could see that it was getting worse and worse and worse. It, um, people stopped looking like people to me. And I stopped looking like a person to myself, and I stopped feeling like a person, and I wanted to be a person again. I started to miss that first good round of sobriety, that first good round of even going to school and um, working a full-time job and showing up to my own life. I missed um, living, I guess you could say. And then furthermore, I was convinced that I was alcoholic. So the first opportunity I, uh, I got, um, I said some prayers, I guess, and magically a little bit of money showed up and I was able to get on a train from San Diego to Seattle. And um, I stayed at the rescue uh, mission at the William Booth Center for a few days, just long enough to detox and get myself into treatment at the ARC. And I've been sober ever since. Um, and as a result of being sober, um, I can't believe it. Uh, in two and a half years, uh, now not only have the voices left, not only am I not talking to myself, um, I have some peace of mind. When life gets bad, I can still sleep at night. Um, I have people that I can trust, that I can talk to about whatever's going on with me and where I need direction. I don't have to pretend I can do it all by myself anymore. It's unnecessary. I don't have to, in fact. Um, actually, I welcome the advice. I welcome the camaraderie. I welcome the, this is what I did, you know, kind of um, talk. And sometimes I can take it or leave it, you know. Not everybody has the answers to all the problems of my life. But for sure, as long as I stay connected in prayer, meditation, learn to breathe so I can calm myself down, um, show up to meetings, be of service to others, especially with other men that suffer from what I suffer with, and I get to see it in their eyes when it's brand new, and I can stay reminded of what, what that's like, um, I can hold on to what I have today, you know, and it's really, really nice. Um, I have, uh, this, this wonderful life now that, you know, I didn't think, uh, was going to turn out the way it's turned out. I went from not having a pot to do anything in, right? <laughs> to having a really nice job with really good benefits, um, I live in a decent place that's clean and safe with the view of water, you know, who would have thought? Um, I have no neighbors above me, you know, and uh, um, I have peace of mind. I'm saving for retirement, you know. I flush, you know, I, f I flush my toilet and the water's blue. And it smells nice, you know, just a little, just like, just, I can't believe it. You know, really, um, I only have one real major thing that's, that I'm waiting to turn in my life that would, that would be positive. And that just, that just hasn't happened. But, um, I know that, um, I'm just waiting for the miracle to happen in that area of my life too, you know, and I don't know how much more time I have. I'm okay? Okay. 
Um, so if you're new, if, if you wouldn't mind, if I could get a, just a show of hands of how many people are in their first year of sobriety. Nice. you come to the right place. Um, I would say read your book. Um, do the steps. Uh, listen to your sponsor, despite uh, if you disagree. You know, just give it a, give it a try. And um, I promise you that if you do this deal, and if you believe that you're truly alcoholic, that if you can't stop when you start after a period of time, and you're tired of living in misery, um, and you want a decent life, and you want to be able to be comfortable in your own skin again, that you can. Um, the program's been around for 81 years. I believe there's something like over 12 million meetings worldwide. And if that isn't enough to convince you that this thing is magical and beautiful and wonderful and that people are really interested in um, living instead of dying, then I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> you know, it really is true. People are doing this thing for real, and um, it's wonderful. You know, when I was 19 or 20, I went to my first meeting, and I heard, I heard people talk about how wonderful it could be, but I didn't believe it. I remember I heard I was in Hollywood somewhere, and I heard a doctor say that he lost his uh, license to practice. He had now had, I don't can't remember, I don't know, 10, 12 years sober, but he was in love with his newfound life, you know, despite his, um, his inability to practice medicine, you know. He was in love with living, and he loved Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, then I was so young, I didn't, I really didn't, I didn't get it, you know. But as time went on, and I started to go to meetings, I started to learn that there was people that came from broken lives, one way or the other, and at the end of the deal, with some uh, acquired time under their belt and doing this, that their lives really were wonderful. Um, I'll end with this. Um, if I could start from scratch and have this life that I have now, and I, I imagine that's only going to get better because I don't, I don't think I'm going to stop doing whatever it is I'm doing. It's like my recipe for success. I heard a man once say that he was a sand flea in the beach and that um, people used to kick sand at him and walk over him and ignore him and um, throw their beer cans at him or whatever, and the guy was just, he was just down and out, completely down and out. But that, you know, he was celebrating 20 years at a meeting when he was sharing, um, and he was now like the head architect engineer guy who was in charge of the blueprints that of putting a hospital together from the ground up, you know? And there's lots of stories like that. I remember hearing a woman say that when she came to Alcoholics Anonymous, she couldn't read. And 10 years later, she's now like a PhD in like whatever volcanic something something. And she was from London and she's working in Hawaii with volcanoes. You know, she went from not being able to read to a PhD. So this program, at wherever you come from or whatever you're doing, whatever you're thinking is really going to change your life in a way that you could never, ever imagine possible. I promise. It does. It works. It's amazing. You know, I get to be really intimate with my feelings and myself and with life like I've never have before. It's amazing. Thank you. Hello. I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. So this is kind of like, you guys all kind of look like actual grown-ups, so that, that's kind of scary, but um, that's compared to like where I usually find myself in AA meetings. Um, uh, again, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. I was going to read something from the book and then just kind of go from there, because that seems to give things form and keep things centered, so just give me un segundo. 
It's in page 25. There is a solution. The great fact is just this and nothing less that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude towards life, towards our fellows, and towards God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do by ourselves. Um, I grew up in Seattle, like hella in Seattle, like uh, Ravenna, next to Ravenna Park. Uh, I started drinking when I was like 12 or 13 with other kids from Eckstein Middle School, and I just thought that's what you did because, like, I just I didn't ever I don't ever remember having like any thought that. I just thought that's what people did. I'd see older people, you know, obviously there's remnants of like the sixties counterculture. So like I knew people's parents who like smoked weed on the low and were successful designers or whatever. And it was just a very, like, I just thought that's what people did when like, you know, I thought that's what you did. And I thought if you wanted to be like a cool dude or a man, that's kind of what you did. And then in another adjunct to that, when I was 14, my dad died suddenly. And I don't think that that really plays any part in me being an alcoholic I think I'm an alcoholic because I like the effects produced by alcohol and I seem to have the allergy that's described in the big book, but that definitely cut me off from God because I remember deciding right then on that day, well, he hadn't died yet, but it was the day where he found out he was going to die and uh, I decided, I I just hated God and I guess if you hate God, that means you actually believe in him, but you're mad at him, but I decided to say that I don't believe in God, but really what it was was that I hated him. Uh, again, you know, just drank a bunch, did other things that people get kind of salty about if you talk about in certain meetings, so I'll just leave that out. And then, uh, <laughs> not, you know, but, uh, you know, partied a bunch in high school, still managed to graduate, went to college in Ellensburg, and I had this, like, image of myself as, like, this tough graffiti writing Dude, that's like a savage. I listen to too much gangster rap. I mean, again, like actually, like ain't nothing to it. The gangster rap made me do it. But uh, so I had this like real like, you know, mindset. And I went out there and promptly like got like hella drunk and like gotten like some weird scuffle in the dorms and spent a little time in Kittitas County Jail and then wasn't in college. But that wasn't have anything to do with my drinking. That's because they're all from eastern Washington and they don't understand city life and they don't get down like me and blah, 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 blah. And they all are like Bush supporters and I don't need that in my life anyway. Cool. Uh, I spent the next couple years bouncing between Seattle and San Francisco, shoplifting and doing lots of other things I'm not supposed to talk about and like whatever. and fancying myself some kind of weird outlaw rebel artist and this, that, and the third. I ended up in New Orleans, which is a great place to be an alcoholic if you're looking to relapse anywhere because there's always someone there that's worse off than you that you can like be like, hey, I'm not the guy picking cigar butts out of beers on Bourbon Street during Mardi Gras, you know, like... <laughs> And, you know, it's, it's way more socially acceptable, like, or I, at least in my experience, I, I was a bouncer at a gentleman's club, so like, I'm sure I had a little bit more, more leeway than your average young professional. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and I never thought I was an alcoholic, you know, I fancied myself like a, a Byron-esque character of wine, woman, and song, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and that was true to some degree, but, you know, it was also, you know, I could have everything. I could be, like, in, like, the sickest condo with, like, 20-foot ceilings and just, like, epically, like, whatever chicks and, like, just want to die. Like, that was, like, the underlying current to, like, most days. And I never, like, really vocalized that too much unless I was coming down really bad off something. But uh, usually I'd wake up and it would just be, like, life was too much. It was unmanageable. It was all these things. And then I tried to – I was, like – I was I was in New York with like hella fool. How am I doing? All right, cool. I was in New York with like hella fools, and it was a great week. It was like one of those like magical weeks in your drinking where it makes the rest of your drinking be like, well, it was fun that week. Like that was a great week. Like I just need to be like that all the time, and you know. But all my friends were like, 
well, either they were like really successful uh, at what they were doing, which might not be the best thing to be doing, or they were like the young professional, like successful people. And then I had this like moment of epiphany, like on the beach one day where I was like, well, if I ever want to be like on those dudes, like level, I'm, I mean, like really like I had this like mental picture of myself as like a manager of a strip club with like, and I was bald and I had a cigar and I had like a racing form and I was like, Hey sugar, give me a cup of coffee. And like, boom. And, and I don't know. Like that's just, and I, and that, that mental picture just like hit me and I was at the beach and I was like, God, you have to stop. And then I stopped drinking for 14 months after that. I didn't do it, go to AA because, duh, I'm not an alcoholic, guys. I'm, I'm a high-powered mutant, you know, too rare to live, too weird to die type thing. <laughs> so, and I, I just went in. I, I quit my job. I moved back to Seattle. I got this really cool internship at this, like, fashion company that's, like, it's tight. It was tight. <laughs> but it was, like, a cool thing. And I didn't drink. I mean, I... I did some other things, but nothing, like, too serious, and uh, I just went along like that, and I didn't drink for 14 months, and then, again, someone, I was with some friend, I started drinking again, it was horrible, the first night out, like, I ended up in a hotel room on Aurora with, like, this super awful, she was, she's probably a nice young lady, but it was just so bad, dude, it was, it was real dark, it was so dark, like, jeez, Louise, and that was, like, after, like, not really doing anything for 14 months, and that's when I decided to come to AA. Came to AA, hated it. I mean, I liked the first one. Agape is cool. Shout out to Rita, you know. But, uh, you know, that was cool, but I started meeting people, and I was like, well, I thought it was a cult. I thought, I thought like, it was all BS. I, like, didn't believe in God. I was hated everyone. I just wanted to, like, punch people in the face and, like, all this, and so I decided that, okay, I'm not an alcoholic, and I just drank for, like, a month, and it was horrible, and I binge-watched seven, seven series of Mad Men, and, like, and, like, cried, and, like, wondered why I couldn't be more like Don Draper, complete, com- complete, completely missing the point that he's, like, super fucked, he's super messed up, you know, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, so there's that, and then I was at this, like, house party with some dudes I know, like, and I was with this, like, this guy I went to high school with who's, like, a DOC probation officer now, and, like, we were, like, and, like, you know, I just I just mimic drinking because uh, I realize it's being recorded. Uh, and he's, like, nah, Joe, you don't need to go to AA. Like, I send scumbags to AA all the time, blah, blah, blah. And then the next day I woke up, and I had to go, like, do some yard work that I'd promised to do for my uncle, and it was the brutalest day ever, and I was so sick, and I just looked up at the sky, and I was like, I just, I, I don't know how to describe it, though, that I gave up, I just, like, gave up, and I was like, all right, whatever, whoever you are, whatever you are, whoever they are, whoever she is, you know, it's, you know what I mean, and I just gave up, and then I just called the dude that I'd asked to be my sponsor, and just started from there, and in the time since then, oh, cool, this is going really well, you know, I just did what, I did what was suggested of me. You know, I got a sponsor. I got a home group. I got a service position. You know, I did, it got to a point, like, where, like, I would have done anything. I would have, like, worn a diaper and, like, picked up a cherry with my butt and carried it across the Aurora Bridge or whatever it is that they say at Fremont Hall. I don't know. I don't go there very much. But I was desperate, you know what I mean? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, this month I have 18 months, and that's pretty chill. And I sponsor guys, and uh, I never want to die. Like, even, like, when, like, the most, like, messed up stuff happens, I don't react the same way. And it goes back to what I read in the books. Like, I look at life differently. When bad things happen, like, I had this, like, whole fiasco this week where, like, I ended up having to fire my sponsor. But I'd been praying about changing sponsors for, like, a month. And then I was like, well, God, show me the truth about this. And then some messed up stuff happened and I was like, Oh wow, that was the truth. And instead of being like upset and like caught up in it and like getting angry about it for like days and days and days, I was able to look at this and be like, well, this is God showing me the truth. And so that just changes this whole perspective where like 
I don't look at the world the same way. I used to not even be able to go to a grocery store. It's like, I'd be so mad. There'd be like some lady in like a, one of those things, those mopeds and she'd be buying hella ding dongs. And I'd be in my head, like screaming, like, you don't need that. You're like, or like road, like road rage when I'm not even on the road would be the best way to describe my day to day life prior to this. And I just wake up and I'm, I'm cool. And some days are worse than others. But if I have like a really bad day, I get to go to bed sober today. And usually when I wake up, the world looks a lot different than it did right before I went to bed, you know, and something happens and I just reach out to new guys and try to be like honest. And when I I mess up, I'm I'm a super brutal, judgmental, mean person. So I say some things that are kind of mean sometimes being funny. I need to work on that. But other than that, you know, this AA completely like saved my life to where I'm getting into situations. Now I have problems in areas where I never used to have problems or I didn't even used to have areas. That's what it is. And I, I don't know, man, it's life is life is beautiful. Like I, I can't describe like the, instead of waking up and not wanting to wake up, I feel very present. And there's even times where I find myself, that my, my mind isn't even talking at all, and I'm completely in the moment, and that's really all I ever wanted when I drank and did things I'm not supposed to talk about at AA meetings. Um, that's all I ever wanted, and I have way more of that now than I ever did before, so I'm just going to shut up, but peace out. Thanks for having me. Hi, my name's Tucker. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Let's see. My sobriety date is... Yeah, press start. Don't let me go over. My sobriety date is May 13th of 2015. That's last year. And um, I do have a sponsor. His name is Mark, and I have a home group, which is the Joe and Charlie Big Book Study at Cherry Fellowship. We meet every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. And if you haven't heard of Joe and Charlie, I highly suggest you come and check it out. It's pretty cool. So uh, I, when I was asked to speak tonight, of course, I immediately start going into, like, alcoholic mode and just, like, oh, my gosh, like, I need to prepare something because I need to sound wise and impart all my wisdom upon you. And um, I don't have any wisdom. Um, I purposefully did not prepare tonight. So if it seems like I'm all over the place, that's the reason. Um, the reason I purposefully did not prepare for tonight was because I find that when I start preparing, um, I start finding myself just being full of... They told me I'm not allowed to cuss at this meeting, so it might be a pretty small or pretty short speech. Um, I, I'm full of it, right? Like, I'll be sitting in a meeting, and I'll be, as instead of listening to what people are talking about, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, how wise I'm going to be, and that's when I know I need to not raise my hand at a meeting. Anyway, so I'm going to stick to uh, what it was like, what happened, what it, what it's like today. Um, what it was like is I drank. I, I, I am a real alcoholic. I... Um, I didn't get into much of that other stuff out there um, that many of us did. I, I experimented with other drugs a few times. I pretty much stuck to alcohol, though. That allowed me to kind of maintain this air of superiority that I wasn't I wasn't like those those dirty drug addicts. Um, drinking is legal. Everybody does it. You know, country musicians sing about it. It's on the TV. Um, it's just part of American life. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know that the way that I drink was different, right? I didn't know that I'm abnormal because I'm my only point of reference, right? Like, I didn't start drinking till I was 18, 19. I'm a late bloomer, um, but I made up for lost time. And the way I drank, I thought everybody drank like that. I thought everybody had that feeling that once, once I put a drink in my body, I immediately crave a second and a third and a fourth. I thought everybody drank to get drunk. Like still to this day, it baffles me. There's people out there that don't try to get drunk when they drink. They just drink because maybe they like the taste of it. Maybe, I don't know, like it looks fancy with the cocktail in their hands. I don't know why they drink if they're not going to get drunk. It baffles me. So I drank to get drunk, and I had I had some fun. Um, back in um, 
my my early days, I surrounded myself with other people who liked to drink and have fun, like I did. And um, it was kind of normal. If you didn't drink like I did, then I probably wasn't friends with you because that's what I wanted to do. And if you weren't drinking, I probably wasn't hanging out with you. As I went on, though, the problems started coming up. I um, Drinking started to affect my life. I started to... It was preventing me from be the pers- being the person that I thought I was, right? I thought I was a pretty good guy. Uh, drinking was getting in the way of that. It was preventing me from um, being honest. It was preventing me from showing up on time. It was preventing me from paying my bills. Um, and it slowly progressed to the point where I was drinking. I would drink every weekend. And then I'd drink every Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then I drink all Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then I drink every night, and then I drink every day, and then I drink all day, every day. And that's that's the kind of drunk that I am. Like when I'm drinking, I I'm drinking, right? Like when people ask, um, <laughs> usually non-alcoholics, you know, when they find out that I my drinking career, they say, "Well, but you didn't drink and drive, did you?" <laughs> it's like, well, I was always drunk, and I had to get places, so. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I drank, I, I drove while intoxicated. Um, I was the designated drunk driver with all my friends because I was really good at it. And that makes people cringe. It makes me cringe that I say that I'm good at drunk driving. Um, but trust me, in the height of my alcoholism, you don't want me driving unless I have a few drinks in me because I am shaking like a leaf. I'm having physical um, withdrawal symptoms. So that I mean that's what it's like. Um, I drank, I fell over, I threw up, um, I drank some more, and things came crashing down around me. I was able to uh, kind of get to the point of desperation. Not kind of. I got to that point of desperation. A series of events, um, you know, jobs, money, and relationships all going away. And when I was twenty-one years old, I believe, 20 or 20 or 21, almost 21 years old, I had a fake ID. Um, I had it, and I did what any self-respecting alcoholic 20-year-old did. I called mommy and daddy, and next thing I knew, they were coming to pick me up, took me off to a little 28-day vacation. And in my first inpatient, that's where I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, That was about 12 years ago, and I have a little over a year sobriety today, so I obviously have not been able to maintain sobriety that whole time, but I have had quality sobriety during that time. I've had much more clean time than than dirty time, than um, (laughs) drinking time in those last 12 years. Because the way I drink, the whole thing about, you know, it's still progressing even though I'm not drinking. That's all true. I'm not going to repeat it. You've all heard it. Um, but when I'd start to drink, I'd, it, I'd pick up worse than where I left off. So I had about five or six years in the program, um, and my, my relapses have been very short, um, mainly because I, I'm not a very tough guy. Like, I have a very low threshold for pain, and I get back here pretty quickly. Each time that I've come back, though, it's it's gotten a lot harder to get back. But so that's kind of what I want to talk about as far as like what happened, right? With AA is my experience coming into AA the first time versus my experience coming in second, third time, right? And um, the first time I had never heard of AA. And it was like all the cheesy metaphors in the book. Um, I grabbed onto the life preserver. I was like, yes, teach me, sensei. I will do this. I don't care what. They say I need to find a God. I'm like, fine. I don't know where God is, but there's a church down the street. I'll go to church. And I just jumped headfirst into this, and I did everything. And I was on fire for AA, and that that served me well for a long time. I was like Mr. Um, Mr. On Fire for AA, you know, s- sponsor, sponsees, home groups, general service, all that stuff. Um, now, what happened then has kind of been a theme in my, um, when I've chosen to go back out and drink, is my life changed, right? 
And historically, I have not been good about dealing with change in AA. So I ended up moving up here to Washington State from California. <coughs> Moved to Spokane over in eastern Washington. And I did, long story short, I didn't go to meetings. I went to a couple meetings. They did them differently than we did them in California. All my friends weren't there. Um, I said, screw this. I'm going to keep going to church. Um, kept going to church, got really involved with church. And I was kind of using that as my meetings. Uh, long story short, uh, the church did not keep me sober, nor could it get me sober when I hit that point of desperation again. Um, and I tried. You know, I, I you know, they, they prayed over me. I got oil and all, all that stuff, speaking in tongues. It didn't work. Um, and unfortunately, my church was such that they actively discouraged me from going back to AA. Um, yeah, those churches do exist. Um, so I've done some fourth step work around that. But I was actually, actually discouraged from going back to AA. I was told it was a cult. I was told I didn't need it. Um, sooner or later, though, I realized that church was a cult and went back to AA. <laughs> it was. It was. It, um, yeah. <laughs> they don't let me back there. Um, anyways, um, I digress. Uh, moved over here to Seattle, got sober, great sober, playing in a sober band, uh, part of a sober motorcycle club, all my friends are sober, it's great, just living, breathing, eating, sleeping, sobriety, um, and I was happy, I was really happy, um, and I was working, I was doing the steps, I had sponsor, I had the sponsees, it's was great, um, life changed, I moved here to Seattle, changed relationships, changed jobs, and... As is my history, I've always tried to make the program that worked for me last year work for me now, right? And that's what I tried to do over here. Um, until eventually I just gave up, stopped going to meetings. A sponsor came, came over and visited me because, of course, I still had my old sponsor. Um, I didn't get a new one. And he said, well, why aren't you going to meetings? And I, I was like, okay, fine. So I did 1990 here, got very plugged in, um, got involved. Had some friends in sobriety that I really relied upon. Life changed again. Friends pass away. Friends move away. Um, ended up getting drunk again. I don't want to keep focusing. Everyone in here, in this room knows how to get drunk, right? So I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus now on um, what it's like today, right? What do I do today to get sober? Um, I was going to meetings. I was terrified about a year and a half ago because I was drinking and I was going to meetings and I was I was trying so hard to get sober. I, I needed to get sober. I wanted to get sober. I was going to meetings. I had the sponsor. And the only thing in the world that had ever helped me get sober, the only thing in the world, Alcoholics Anonymous, wasn't working for me. And I was terrified because I was like, oh, shit. You know, they call this the last house. Oh, sorry. They call this the, the last house on the block. And I was like, man, even the last house on the block isn't working for me anymore. Um, I was terrified to go back to inpatient because, you know, I was very important. I had important things to do. You know, I had a, had a wife, had a pregnant wife to take care of, and I had a very important job to take care of. Well, the wife was about ready to kick me out. The job was about ready to fire me. Um, Wife and job helped encourage me. I like to think that I checked myself into rehab. Everyone thinks they checked themselves into rehab. No one checks themselves into rehab. No one checks themselves. No. So um, I checked. The only reason I can say I checked myself into rehab is because I took a taxi there because my wife was done. She was so done she didn't even want to drive me to rehab. So I checked myself in 28 days. Um, I did... What I did the first time I read the book, I did what they suggested me to do. Um, when I got out, I had a sponsor. Um, I'm working with that sponsor today. Um, gone through the steps. Um, still reading the big book on a regular basis with him. I'm working with sponsees. I'm in the market for sponsees right now um, because what I find today is helping other people is the joy of this program. Um, I mean, let's face it. We're, it's the middle of August, we're in a church basement, and coffee, I don't know, coffee probably sucks, it does at most meetings. Like, that's not why I'm here tonight, right? That's not why I go to this program. I go to this program because 
I need to stay sober first and foremost, but how I do that is helping other people. And not because I'm a spiritual guru, but because that's just what I have to do. Like, that's what I've realized. Um, and I hate talking about helping other people because it makes me seem like, oh, well, I'm, I'm such a great person. No, it's not. It's just because I need to save my ass. I'm very matter of fact about it. I'm like, well, shit. My sponsor had, sorry. <laughs> my, my, my sponsor hasn't called me for two weeks. God darn it. Now I need to go find someone else. Right? I'm like, oh, that sponsor was convenient. He lived right around the corner from me. <laughs> oh. And you see how selfish that is. It's like, yeah, 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 he's drinking. He's, you know, he's drinking himself to death. He's probably locked up. Yeah, but me, me, I need to help somebody, right? So, you know, I'm not under any delusion that I'm, like, changing the world tonight or helping someone tonight. Um, but someone asked me to be here, and I'm lazy, I don't like going out and searching for sponsors or searching for opportunities to be of service. So when someone comes to me and says, here, take this, I'm like, oh, yes, please, freebie. So this is my freebie for tonight. So thank you guys so much for um, listening to me. Sorry, we can bleep that out on the recording if someone's recording that. And um, I hope the next speaker has something more inspiring than what I had to say. <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Trevor, alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is 9-23-13. My home group is Four Horsemen, and my sponsor is Fergus. He's still back in Malaysia, where I used to live. Um, I wrote that down, so I wouldn't forget any of that. Um, super grateful to be asked to be here tonight, and I'm always happy to talk and share my story. Um, just um, one disclaimer. Um, some people say their stories have a lot of uh, drugs in them as well as alcohol. My story has a little bit of sex and relationships in them. It's there just to explain what happened around my alcoholism. I go to another program for that, and I'm always open to talk about it, but tonight I'm here to talk about my alcoholism first. So, um, Before I was sober, I thought I had this beautiful, picture-perfect family. Like, I thought my family was great. I, and people would ask me, like, oh, you know, how was your family life? Oh, yeah, you know, I fought with my mom, but it was great. And it was only about a year and a half into sobriety that I looked back at my family, and I looked at my mother's side, and we're a big family. We're like 25, 30 people in extended family. Every single one of us is an alcoholic, a codependent, or a codependent alcoholic. I mean, every one of us. And I was like, oh, okay, well, my dad's head isn't that bad. And I'm like, wow. My grandfather was tyrannical. All of my, my father and his two siblings can hardly speak to each other. You know, maybe this really is a family disease. Like, maybe this is not, maybe this makes a little bit more sense there than I think it does. Um, so I came from a pretty... You know, I didn't have the best start in life. Um, when I was really young, normal kid, um, I had a friend. We were close, as sometimes young kids do. We kind of explored and did some different things, and um, that friendship really quickly turned to abuse. That was a hard thing for me. Um, but most more importantly, it was a hard thing for me because as we've moved on in our lives, he ended up being popular, having friends, and being heterosexual. I ended up starting to get bullied for being gay. I saw that we did the same thing, but that he was okay. He was fine. He has friends. Girls are talking to him. Here I am over here. Girls aren't talking to me the way that they're talking to him. We talk about Barbies. We talk about hair. We play house. It's fun. I had a great time. <laughs> but I'm different. I have friends, guy friends, but the friendship's a bit different. Here I am. I'm completely on my own. And I have this thing that we've done that I can't talk to him about. I have this secret I have to take care of with me. I'm so broken, I have this. I'm the worst person in the world. I had that from about age eight. It wasn't a really good start. I get up to the fifth grade, and this is pretty much when, um, to keep my language clear, um, kids learn the F word that rhymes with maggot. And I got called that a lot. I had no idea what that meant. Like, full disclosure, I didn't know what gay was, but everyone else seemed to know what it was and know who I was. And it was like my entire life, everything that I'd had up until that point, just disappeared from around me. So here I am, alone in the world, bullied for things I don't understand. I had no idea who I was. Um, I like to split my story up into three parts, how it was, where, um, what happened, and then what it's like now. 
I'm getting close to five minutes, so we'll go through the next couple of years a little bit quicker. Um, long story short, middle school, awful. I don't know why they invented it. Um, <laughs> I get to high school. I'm still a bit awkward. Um, and I experienced my first, you know, I was very religious, but I experienced my first true moment of um, contact with the higher power when I prayed to God for a year of whether or not I was supposed to be gay. And it's the closest I've ever been to God. He was in the room with me. Whatever your concept of higher power was, that was in the room with me that night. And he was just like, yeah. And life got a bit better. Like it did. It got better. So what happened? So I graduate high school. I'm way more popular. I'm like top of my class. Everyone knows me. I'm getting scholarships for gay activism. Um, and I still am utterly uncomfortable with myself. I finished high school up in Yakima. And I went from the big city of Yakima, if you've been there, to Turkey for a high school exchange. I go off to a Muslim country, language I don't speak, it's very liberal, and I can drink alcohol. And see, before, I could drink alcohol. I could drink alcohol at home. I had some wine with my dad or maybe a beer at a party. Or, you know, I'd have a little bit of this or that with some friends. But it was always really, really sporadic. And getting it... My friends, when I lived in other countries, would laugh at the, like, hoops I had to go through. They just went to the store. Sixteen, no one carded them. And no one was carding me. White boy with money in Turkey? Yeah. <laughs> but I was also legal. It didn't matter. I had a friend who was 14 who used to go to the bar with me. She brought her dog. So here I am, drinking, and all of a sudden, I'm kind of reinventing myself. I'm out with friends. I'm doing adult things. I'm feeling independent. And throughout all of this is drinking. I later look back on this part of my life, and while I was still out, I used to genuinely think I didn't get hangovers because I was hungover every day for eight months. I just thought that was what people felt like in the morning after they turned 19. Um, so then I moved to London for university. I move around a lot. I'm sorry, I did a ton of geographics, and I did them in a hard way. Um, and that was where I really started to feel special because being gay in London wasn't looked down on like it was here. They were like 10, 15 years ahead of us. It wasn't like an issue. No one flinched when I said I was gay. They were like, yeah, cool, nice, move on, everyone else is. <laughs> and so I started going out, and I started drinking. And like I said, I mentioned there was some sex in my story. This is where it happened. I went out, I would drink a bit, and all of a sudden there were these men who were interested in me. And it wasn't just that they were gay men. They could have been any man. They could have been a dead man. But if he said, like, hey, you're good enough, like, I want to date you, I would have just fallen over for him. <laughs> but I couldn't get to that point without alcohol. I would use alcohol to just get me to do these things I thought I needed to do to be accepted, to be loved, to be wanted for the first time in my life. So my drinking starts progressing, progressing, um, my behavior starts getting worse and worse. But I'm keeping it together. I have a part-time job. I'm doing well in school. Like, I'm learning Japanese because I'm so smart. Um, and so as part of that degree, I go off to Japan. And I still feel like a break in my brain. Like, I can feel it when I think about it. Because one thing that had been in my life, like, I, I really wanted that close, straight friend who just... I, I don't know, I was just really close to it, where it wasn't sexual, where I didn't really have too many feelings towards him, which that didn't go that way. Um, and I'd had straight guy friends before, and we'd been close, but for some reason I still had this need. And this friend showed up in my life, and he was a great guy, and he's still a great guy, and we still keep in contact, and he's still one of my best friends. But for whatever reason, my life just kind of got flipped upside down. Because now... If I kind of acted a little bit differently or talked a little bit differently or did some things differently, I had this really good friend, and I felt like if I did these things, I'd have more friends like this. And what was the number one this thing that this friend and I would do? Go out and get wasted. Ten in the morning. Let's go get some beers and watch a movie. So I thought I had to get drunk to keep these people around me. Like, if, if I'm not drinking, these people aren't going to open up to me. I'm not going to open up to them. We're not going to become friends. I'm going to be rejected again. Like, this is what's keeping me going. This, and when I meet a guy who's into me, being easy. Um, I got back from Japan, had a miserable year in England. I love that country. I still sometimes want to go back. 
but I had a miserable year because I was so broken and torn up from all these things that happened to me. So I'm still drinking. I'm going out. I'm just, I had a bunch of Irish friends, and the stereotypes are all true. Um, I have seen some things. I just, you know. So I'm just pounding it back, pounding it back, pounding it back. I go back to Japan to pursue a career there. I'm now all of a sudden living in the country alone. I don't live on my own. I can't, I have to have someone to talk to. So what do you do when you're alone? You drink. I mean, this was, I started to realize I had a problem about this time. It was a Wednesday night, and I was at home, 1.30, alone, and I just went to myself like, how am I this drunk? How did this happen? So I started, I had a mental breakdown, I had to go see a shrink in Japanese, which I was so proud about. I got a job in a different country, I moved away, and I was like, that's it. It's all behind in Japan. All the men, all the alcohol, all the drugs, all that stuff, all the hatred of myself, it's there. I don't have to worry about it. And if any of you have ever moved to get away from your alcoholism, as you know, that stuff, like you can't even weigh it on the scale. It just comes with you every time. And everything escalated. So I'm in Singapore, country where it's illegal to chew gum, and everything escalated. Thank God I was in that country because it kept me away from drugs at a sheer terror. But going out, finding different men to go get with, and going out and getting drunk. I mean, it's an expat culture. Tons of Brits, they love to drink. So here I am, you know, co-signing my own malarkey, and um, it all just explodes. It just explodes. Um, but it exploded with the men first. So I go to a program, I start getting sober, and it's just like instant relief. Like, I take a centimeter, and thousands of pounds are lifted off my back. And so I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I got this. I got this. So I'm sober in this program. I'm working towards sobriety in that program. And I'm like, oh, let's go have some drinks. And I am getting hammered. I go back to Yakima to see my family. I put my life at risk by driving drunk. I've never done that before in my life. I am just blitzed all the time. I'm making these terrible decisions. And I can't, I don't know what's going on with me. So I get back to Singapore. I think everything's fine. Like, I'm just like, oh, you know, I had a bad night. Long story short, on a day when I told myself I wasn't going to drink because I had to make a call to my sponsor, I got so drunk and then called him. And it, like, it hurts every time I think about that because, as I'm sure most of you know, like, you give your time when you sponsor someone. I get your time when you sponsor me. And I'm mocking it. I'm wasting it. I had never been so ashamed in my life. I went to the doctor the next day, and like classic, like, are you an alcoholic? I lied about how much I drank to get a sick note. You need sick notes for work in Singapore. It's like school. Um, <laughs> and it broke my heart. So I start going to, I keep going to my other meetings, and I stop drinking. And at first, it's just, you know, I'm not drinking. And we'll see. And then about a year later, it's, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to drink again. That's cool. About six months after that, I'm like, I'm probably an alcoholic, but they don't want me in these meetings. I mean, it wasn't my first problem. It wasn't the first thing I went in for. It wasn't what caused me to just try to give everything over to God. And I always remind myself of tradition three. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Because I have a desire to stop drinking every damn day of my life. Sorry, every day of my life. And I'm very passionate about it. So, two years from my finishing alcohol... Still working the steps. I go to my first AA meeting. And I'll tell you, like, right now, my other meetings are for my other stuff. And my AA meetings are for my alcoholism. And it is fantastic. Being in recovery, and it's about three years for me, is amazing. Like, it's honestly amazing every day that I, every morning, still get on my knees, but I still go through that day with that thought that, like, oh, man... I'm just a terrible person. No one's like me. No one's got my problems. And then I walk in here, and you all have the same problem as me. We all have the same stuff. And it's amazing. Every day I get a look around at this room of people, and I'm like, well, there's two options. One, we're all terrible, awful people. We've all somehow managed to congregate here together. Or two, we're all pretty normal for most purposes, for all intents and purposes. Like, we're normal people that God loves, that are benefits to society that have a problem that we're working on every day of our lives. I didn't know that. I didn't know that growing up. Some days I still don't know that. Alcohol was 
definitely a solution to that problem at first, but it's not a good one. It almost killed me. I could have crashed. I could have done a million different things. I could have gotten diseases. I got God now. God's my solution. And some days I fight him, and some days I don't want to listen to him, and some days I just want to scream at him and be like, no, I got this. I want to do this my way. And then for whatever it is, whenever I get to that point where I just get so frustrated, I'm like, all right, I'll do whatever you tell me. And I let go and let God, which I used to laugh at when people said that statement, and now I say it all the time. My life just works. Like, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I came into recovery to solve a specific problem. I got a whole new way of life. I got a hundred times more than I ever thought I was going to get. Like, yeah, I don't drink, and that's great, but I'm authentic with people now. Not perfect at it, but people know who I am. I feel like I know who I am. I don't know everything. I still don't totally know who am I, but I know way more than I ever did three years ago. And I'll know more tomorrow than I do today. And honestly, I've got normality in my life. Yeah, I still have emotions. I still feel pain. I still hurt. Things are still difficult for me. I'm not saying this program has taken away every last pain in my life. But I feel those emotions. I'm present with them. I know what they mean. I know what they're saying with me, to me. And I can just deal with them. Get on with the business of living and live a good life. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.